Hello, and welcome to this devlog for my indie game, Legend 64. It's a third-person adventure with an N64-inspired visual style, where you encounter ghosts, fight undead monsters, and solve mysterious puzzles. In this video, I'd like to introduce you to the game's main character. After becoming hopelessly lost in a deep forest, you are waylaid by its mysterious inhabitants, who steal your most precious possession, and armed with nothing but your courage and determination, you embark on a quest to retrieve it. The character is sitting at 890 triangles, which is just a small amount more than Young Link here. I could probably lower the triangle count by deleting the faces that you're never going to see on places like the feet and arms, but you know what? I like an airtight mesh, so I'm not going to do that. For the character's textures, I've tried to go for an old school approach, where the artist would reuse as much of the same textures as possible across the entire model. Here you can see how I've stretched the texture over the entire surface to create the trousers. Same goes for the folds in the character's robe. I really like this approach because I'm lazy, but it also feels more authentic to the games I'm trying to emulate. There are 14 unique textures on the model and a total of 16 free slots left on the atlas, 11 of which are 64 pixels in size. These I'm going to use for the character's facial animations. Looking cool. I'd say they're ready to fight some ghosts now. But you won't be facing the challenge of the spirit world alone. I'd like to introduce you to your companion throughout the game, a wayward soul named Ember. Together, the two of you must travel the haunted depths of the demonic castle to recover what you've both lost. Much like Navi from The Legend of Zelda, Ember contextualizes the game's target mechanics and serves as a visual indicator of what objects can be interacted with. Ember will move to the nearest targetable object to you and will allow you to lock onto it. I'm planning a lot of other functionality around Ember, but for now, it's nice to have a buddy exploring the castle with you. The animation for Ember uses 16 frames of unique animation for the flame. I've then added some additional effects such as transparency, lens flares, and a distortion effect. I've then played it back in Unreal Engine using my old trusty flipbook node technique. And the sprite will always face the camera no matter the angle. To add to the sense of movement, I wanted a trail to follow the soul as it floats along. I experimented with the Niagara particle system for this and was able to set a trail that would follow behind Ember using this ribbon here. I was able to set the ribbon's width and speed until I got a desirable result. Now whenever the player moves, we get this cool trail flowing behind from Ember. With the two main characters in the game, I can finally show off some gameplay. So far, the character can short hop, ledge grab, climb up from hanging, drop down, and grab ledges from a fall or jump. The climbing system is fully automated and will activate based purely on a set of rules that are being checked continuously as the game is running. To accomplish this, it uses what I best describe as a charge-up method, where certain inputs on the controller have to be held and charged before any actions can take place. To determine when the charge will happen, I've used a line trace that is checking for collision at all times, so as soon as something hits those traces, the rules will then come into play and check what is eligible and what can be climbed on or not. If it meets the requirements stated by my rules, then the charge can begin. I've set the charge limit to about one second, and I'm going to keep tweaking this number until the wait time seems about right. Whenever the count reaches the limit, which is the number you can see here, the climb action will be allowed to take place. The charge will only happen once those rules I mentioned earlier are met, and to do that I've had to set up some conditions for the rules, like a Nen user from Hunter Hunter or something. But what kind of condition? Condition 1. For the charge to begin, the potential climbable surface must be above a certain height, otherwise the character will try and climb up when they don't need to. Condition 2. There must be a limit to how high the potential climbable surface is, or the player will jump way too high to climb the ledge. Condition 3. 
condition free. A climbable surface must be directly in front of the player. Otherwise, they'll get flung off into oblivion. I've actually run afoul of this a few times, where the character would start climbing on the skyboxes in some levels. Condition 4. The player must be moving for the charge to work. If the player is next to a climbable surface and standing still, it would obviously suck if the character just randomly started climbing without any provocation. Condition 5. The player has to be moving for the charge to start, but they can't be moving too fast, otherwise an unintentional climb will take place when the player is merely just trying to run alongside a climbable surface. Condition 6. The surface angle of the climbable area needs to be set, otherwise the player will be able to climb all over awkward spots and it would just look like crap. I've set a custom angle between 0 and 1 degree so that any surface has to be almost flat for the climb to work. I'm not sure what all that means. I know all that sounds confusing and it was definitely a little tricky to get the logic to work with the conditions because if they aren't put in the correct order, things will break or just not work as intended. With all that said and done, I'm going to create a quick level and test out the climbing system. Let's -a go! Alright, it's ready. Can we reach the top? Well, that was fun. All of the character animations you've seen were made in Blender. I've used shape keys in Blender to refine parts of the animation that were looking broken. The hem of the robe in particular is quite tricky as it's guaranteed to clip with the legs most of the time. I tried my best to weight paint it to the appropriate part of the skeleton, but of course it was never going to be perfect and this area needed a lot of adjustment. Each animation requires its own set of shape keys to help make it look better. A run animation will have to use a very different set of shape keys from a climb animation, for example. This was a little tedious to set up as the more corrective shape keys you have, the more you'll have to worry about them overlapping each other, making the final animation look really strange. So, for example, if during the climb animation, one of the shape keys that I want to use for the run animation gets applied as well, the robe will be applying both shape keys and start clipping with the legs again. The way I found to prevent this is to animate the shape keys using their own dedicated action editor, similar to how animations are applied to the skeleton and then setting the value of the unwanted shape keys to zero so that they don't interfere when not needed. Of course, this can get quite complicated when you're using lots of shape keys, so I've tried to minimize the potential for error by using a clear naming structure for the shape keys. For example, shape keys relating to the body will use the prefix body and then followed by what animation the shape key is used for. In this case, climb and then ending with the number of the frame that I want that shape key applied to. I need to be upfront about this. Bringing shape keys out of Blender sucks. If you know of a good way of doing this, please let me know. But so far, this is the method I use to get it to work, and I'm happy to share it with you so you don't have to suffer needlessly. Firstly, before exporting anything, make sure the character is set to use the desired animation pose. In this case, we're going to use the run animation. Then select each mesh to use the corresponding shape keys. So each part of the model in this case has been set to use the shape key animation for the run cycle. With that done, select everything and hit export. Here are my export settings if you're curious. Also, make sure that apply modifiers is unchecked, otherwise the shape keys aren't going to work at all. 
Now that's done, go into Unreal Engine, select the animation you want to apply the shape keys onto. In this example, it's the run animation. Choose it and select Reimport with new file. This will give you the dialog box that allows you to check these options that will override the shape keys for that animation. I have to do this every time I want to bring in an animation and it needs to be the same export as what I originally brought in, otherwise it's not gonna work with that mesh or skeleton. This took me hours to find a working solution, but the important thing is it does work, I guess. With all the animations for the character finally in the engine, I wanted to add some facial animations, similar to how I did with the Vampire S. I created two frames of animation that I wanted to play back and then lurp them together with a sign node. Simple but effective. Thank you for watching and I hope you've enjoyed the video. If you'd like to help me make content quicker, please consider joining my Patreon and supporting the game. If not, I'd really appreciate a like and subscribe. And as always, I'd like to thank these 64-bit legends for their continued support. You guys are awesome and you've really helped keep me motivated to work on the game. So thank you to LRC Napkin, Grayson Keys, Mario Tavalieri, Chumbledorf, Tyler Hughes, Oliver Honleycan, Yaya Dambuz, Mason Stooksberry, Waro Duck, Sebastian, Melty Metroid, Warren McPeak, Paul Mayer Gorm, Icy Hot, Charles Tanner, Daniel H. Hernandez, Starkium, Our Hungry Fool, Flash the Reploid, Ryan Burry, Jake Hellspawn, Gatekeeper, Nick Grossi, Nicola Wallen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.